That was really interesting. So Lynn Besa has been in Chicago. You know, she 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 came to Chicago, I think, five, six years ago from Seattle, and I think has made huge inroads here. And, you know, some of the conversations we were talking about had to do with, you know, your audience and how you move into a scene and how you and how how so much of what we do in the art world is about relationships. I mean, I know that we, we want Linda to particularly talk about public and private commissions and how to situate yourself um, for getting them. But I also want to know from, you know, some of your biography or your history, Lynn, about and then, you know where you went to grade school, high school, how you, why you were in Seattle and how you got out of Seattle and why you came here in the first 60 seconds before we move on to everything else, okay? All right, a minute. Now, I also have to unmute you. Also, no wonder it's so quiet in here. Um, okay, Lynn, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, first, I want to say I just love Jerry. He's so he's just so unspoiled. He's just not the stereotype of the hoity-toity, unapproachable art critic that you have. But I have to say, that after listening to him, even though I make a living as an artist, I feel like. Maybe I'm not, that I can't really make a living as art. I think it's very possible. And um, Hold on, um, somehow or another, the top end, something's wrong with the, the acoustics. Um, is your, maybe your microphone is on too loud, is what somebody's telling me. It wouldn't surprise okay. me. Okay. Let's see. I'm going to. Oh, that's it, better already. Is that already? Well, a little bit. Maybe not. <laughs> I'm going to just turn down the microphone. We have it all the way up. Okay, I just turned it down. Yeah, that's better, and then we can turn our volume up a little bit ourselves. Okay. okay. So you think you can make money in the art world? People can do that? I know lots of artists who are making perfectly nice livings, and they're not art stars, and um, some of them aren't even in galleries. But uh, to go back to uh, what my history is, yes. I, I'm one of those people who always knew they wanted to be an artist, always practiced art, went to art school, and um, but I was afraid I'd, I'd starve in the gutter, so I went to graduate school and got a professional degree. I got a master's in public administration and arts <laughs> management. And I happened to come of age in Seattle, the time when public art was at its ascendancy, and the Seattle Arts Commission was the, 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 one of the leaders in developing uh, public art as we know it today. So, um, oh God, people are leaving. <laughs> oh well, I should have expected that. Um, but, and then my first job was as a corporate art uh, curator for a, a large Fortune 500 company. I did my master's thesis on public art, um, on corporate art collecting, and set about to get a job in much the same way you're teaching people to network to get jobs, and I mean to make relationships. And uh, all my friends were full-time public artists, and I was just surrounded always by artists, and I could see that it, it was possible. And um, I, I, for a long time, I did fiber. Because, uh, I did rugs and pastries because I thought I would revolutionize rugs and turn them into an expression, the same you know way expressive art form that painting could be. And it just wasn't accepted. Fiber is still a ghetto, except for a few people. It's still a ghetto in the market, and uh, at least the way I did it. And so then I switched to painting about 10 years ago, and I quit my job as a, a curator of the, a very large hospital, and I moved to Chicago just because I was coming here every year for art fair, and I just loved it. I just fell in love with Chicago and had to live here, and so I just picked up and moved, and I've never regretted it. So I, I, apply, I make my living as an artist uh, two ways. I have a studio practice, and I, make, uh, I do help large-scale public art commissions around the country. And I, I work really hard, and I'm never going to be written about by Jerry Salt. So I'm never going to be probably in a New York gallery, but there are like a bajillion artists like me who are making a living and who are making the kind of work we want to make. And we're just having very full, fabulous lives of doing that. And I think that's what the, these uh, Paul series is all about, actually, how to do that. So my, I'm not going to just be here, you know, shooting the shit with you tonight. I actually have a bunch of really nuts and bolts things to show you if you're interested in, in seeing that about how to find public art commissions and and a, and um, 
we could just go through that. But I'd love to know if you guys have any questions at the beginning that are just burning that you want to ask me. Somebody raise your hand instead of me unmuting everybody if you have a question initially of Lynn. I know that some of you sent in questions that I did forward to her. Yeah, I got one question. I mean, I got one email from somebody who had several questions, and so I remember that. Okay. Nobody has any questions? Yeah, I, I don't see any right now. That I'm <laughs> have any of you done public art commissions at all? I have. I have. You have? Great. Who said that? I have to. I know Mary Broger has. Victoria Fuller has. Would like to. Oh, right, right. Okay, good. So I hope I'm not showing you anything that's going to be too elementary. I myself feel like I can never hear enough about uh, what I need to do from from other artists. I, I have this insatiable need. Oh, also, I, I teach in the same department that Jerry teaches in at the School of the Art Institute. I teach uh, a class called Public Art Professional Practices and in the sculpture department. And when I first started working there, I thought, oh, there are all these books on how to get your work into galleries, so there must be one on how to be a public artist. And so uh, I looked, and there wasn't one. And then I thought, OK, great, crap, i got to write one. So I wrote The Artist's Guide to Public Art, How to Find and Win Commissions. And it just takes you step by step into how to find and win public art commissions. And it was published by Allworth Press. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get started on my slideshow. Do you want me to turn the controls to you, Lynn? Yes. Well, I'm going to do the share my des desktop thing that you taught me how to do the other day. I think I have to give you control. Go ahead and try, okay. but Give me control. You need it. I'm not doing anything. You need control, don't you? Okay. I got I still need control at all times about everything. But you know, that's another topic of another webinar. Uh, I am now the presenter. Okay. So I'm going to share my desktop with you. And Paul, if you see anybody who has questions. I um, can't see that anymore. You can't see No, can you, I can't I can't see the questions with you having the oh, desktop. Can you can you see my desktop? Yeah. OK. So what I'm going to do is every time I touch you, it moves. OK. I'm just going to quickly go through this and uh, explain to you some of the basics of public art so um, you understand what you're up against for this. So there are 500 percent for art agencies in the country. And those are all um, each State, county, city can decide whether they want to have one. And they have to make a law called, you know, that they vote on a percent for art ordinance. And so that's like if a library or a police station or something gets built, a small percent gets set aside that is going to be for art. So like a half a percent in some states like Florida, up to 2% in some cities like um, in Portland, Oregon, San Francisco. Uh, several cities in California, but most of them have 1%. In Chicago, we have 1.33%, but that 33% goes towards administrative costs. And um, it used to be that you'd have to convince cities that public art was good for them, but now you really don't much anymore, um, except maybe in Wisconsin. I hear the governor's threatening to get rid of it. But it's like a real, it's become a political thing again now that art is somehow um, morally corrupting, but uh, so we just have to fight that. And, and public art creates a lot of jobs in addition to drawing attention to an area and advertising that you, that a city is cultured enough to move to. This is people, I have like 12 union workers working for three months on my uh, Toronto floor I did for the Indianapolis airport. So here's what you guys need to know. Um, here's how you find public art commissions. There are tons and tons of calls for artists out there. And each one of those agencies, from the city or county, all these 500 agencies around the country, they put out their own call for artists. There's no centralized list. So you have to do the work of finding these. And they're, they're not hard to find. You can, you can 
I'll show you ways to find them. So there are these lists that you can look into, and you have to sign up for all these lists. So some of these just send out calls, like for culture in, in, uh, in Seattle is a really good public art agency, but they also do lists of other calls for artists coming out. Uh, New England Foundation for the Arts has a public art segment now. Dallas, I mean, there's, there's just a million of them. CAFE is the first attempt to make a centralized list, and it's uh, put out by the West staff, by the Western State Arts Foundation, and they have a really good list. What I do is I, look, I do Google Alerts, and I, I look for public art, and then I'll look for RQ, or I'll look for call for artists plus public art plus RQ, and I get, you know, dozens of these a day, and it'll look something like that. Art Opportunities Monthly is only $20 a year, and it um, is really, has a really good listing of public art. You need to try to dig deeper than the low-hanging fruit, because everybody's going to be applying for these things. Um, but don't get discouraged at how many hundreds of people apply to them, because most of them won't do their application correctly, and they won't, their work won't be suitable for what, for the project they're applying for. Um, they won't have read the application all the way through, and, you know, it, it might be only open to artists in the Midwest, but they might be from L.A., so it's really imperative that you know how to fill out the application. I know that's really boring, but I find that very encouraging, because if you can, you can do a really good application, you can, uh, have a much better chance of winning. So follow the instructions. I know you've all heard that since the first grade, but it's just amazing how many people haven't gotten that memo yet. So I actually hire, have hired an assistant, Chelsea Culp. Uh, she's my studio manager now, to just methodically go through and find and apply and get on the announcement list and the registries list for every single uh, call for artists. And you can find that in the Americans for the Arts Build Directly directory. So you need to Google the Americans for the Arts Build directory, and you'll get to this screen, and you need to look for the public art program area. And then you'll find all 500 with all their contact information to go through that. Now, this is impossible to do, but um, the fact is most artists won't do it, and so that will put you ahead every, the more you, the more lists that you're on, the more you'll be ahead of uh, in a more rarefied atmosphere of, of fewer artists who compete against. I don't like to think of competing against my fellow artists, and I, we don't, in the sense that all of our work is different. But um, it's competing just in sheer numbers. So you need to get up into the area where there aren't as many numbers of artists for you to compete against. Getting into these pre-qualified artists these pools that they're juried is a really great way to do it because there may be 700 people applying, but only 160 will get in. And the way the artists are chosen is the public art program manager will just sit there and go through the list uh, by hand and pick out artists to be in. I mean, to to invite to be into this into this pool. That's when you need to be doing your networking. You need to have your name out there. You need to be on the public art network listserv so that you got you get some name recognition with all these arts administrators. You're kind of like the fox in the hen house in the public art network listserv because so few artists belong on it or have joined it. And it's like every public art administrator in the country is on it, and there are like you know 40 artists on it. So. I was really able to build up some good name recognition by being on that. So you need to apply to lots of competitions and get on lots of registries. So a real problem, this is where the making the leap comes in, a real problem that studio artists have is how do I show, how do I show that I can do a public art commission? It's that all important if you haven't done one, if all you have is studio work, just show. Well, there's some things you can do. The other thing you need to remember 
is that these public art agencies, they can't just keep choosing the same artist over and over again, although it seems that way sometimes. They're always looking for new blood. So the first thing you have to do is you have to, and this is really hard for me, the artwork for creative for public spaces is different than studio work. And I know this seems just really simplistic, but um, once I realized that to place the same kind of, uh, I have to, you know, break new ground, do the shock the public sort of thing, or a lot of this criteria that's, that's based on studio work, you apply so much differently than when you put your work in the <coughs> context. And so the other big thing is, another big leap most artists have trouble making is that you don't have to make the work yourself. You can hire fabricators. And so by, and that just opens up a whole huge world of materials. Like the big pieces of uh, terrazzo floors I do, I don't know how to do terrazzo. All I need to know is how to dial the phone and find somebody who does terrazzo. And that way I can focus on actually making the art and I don't have to be managing employees and insurance and workman's comp and pregnancy leave and all of that stuff. So here's how you can get started. You can start applying with your studio work. And a really important thing is writing a good letter of interest. And I have in my longer workshops that I give, I go into that in length and actually in the book because that's really key. And the letter of interest is not an artist statement. You can self-initiate projects. Partner with an experienced public artist. A really good thing to do is partner with a respected fabricator. We have some really good ones in town, like Vector is a great fabricator, Methods and Materials. Um, and then just, you know, there are lots of other artists who do murals and that you could work with. So you could Photoshop your studio work into a public setting, like Take a painting, Photoshop it onto a wall, something like that. But make sure it, you, because you can make Photoshop look really convincing, like it's in real life. And you don't want them, the committee to think you're fooling, you're trying to fool them. So you just say that it's a proposal or something. So if you're still in art school, take classes where you can make art in the community and you can intern with a public artist. What's great about it is it's a really level playing field. It's just so much less of a game than I found the whole world that the whole gallery world is. I dropped out of the gallery world almost completely just because I just can't take it anymore. I just got so spoiled doing these public art commissions. And But I'm getting back into that because uh, I'm really getting into my painting these days and that galleries are unavoidable after that. But public art is a really friendly place to be in. I'm going to just show you a few artists to give you an idea of what their studio work is like and how they've translated that into their public work. Now, this is a person who does clay prints and ink prints on paper. And this is her studio work. I mean, this is her public art. This is laser cut steel. And you can see she hasn't really sacrificed anything in her, her aesthetic. But she's just thought of it in a different scale and in a different material and had somebody else make it. This is etched on glass. A transit shelter. Here's someone who does, you know, really nice landscape painting. And here's a mosaic that she did. She hired Mosaica in Montreal to do something. And here's the Houston airport. She did everything in this environment, the floors, the columns, brass insets into the floor. That strip on the top, that's the actual original painting. All of that came from this one painting, this 18-inch, 300-inch long painting. And she sent the painting to Mosaica, and then they translated it into ceramic, I mean, Byzantine glass. Nice painted glass, small pieces, and here's the piece she did for the Seattle uh, Tacoma International Airport. And here's, I get lots of students who start out as street, doing street action, and this is um, Juan Angel Chavez, a Chicago artist, who's now teaching in the sculpture department also at FAIC. 
And so he was doing these all over town. And then Stone Transit in Seattle hired him to do something. Then he got another commission in Chicago and another one. He did this with Kareem Peterson. And here's a really exquisite one he did for the pink line. Another painter, Ann Gardner. And this is a piece she did for uh, in King County in Seattle. These are all mosaic, but you can see a lot of the same motif that she just got in different dimensions. The terrazzo floor. This is, um, by the way, this is what a finalist presentation should look like. If you give a lot of detail on how it's going to be built, you'd be amazed. You'll spend hundreds of hours coming up with your concept, and you'll show it to the committee, and then all the questions will be like, uh, so how are you going to attach that thing? Uh, how do we clean it? You know, there's nothing really, nobody really asks conceptual questions about the work. I think they're, most of the time they're just nervous to do that, although they expect the conceptual to relate to the site where the work is going to be. She has her own studio where she hires people to make the work for her. There are always so many photographers in my workshop that I like to show some examples of things that, that they're able to do. Anything you can do that can be reproduced digitally is your golden. In fact, even 3D sculpture now can be, with rapid prototyping, can be made very large and in automated ways. Another nice flower painter. This is laser cut aluminum. Fiberglass. That's the airport again. This is mosaic. Cast brass. Now, calls for com artists come in two forms. You get requests for proposals and requests for qualifications. And I no longer apply to re request for proposals because they're asking to me to submit an idea for site specific artwork for site that I haven't seen, and I just this is an oxymoron to me. And it's also a way of getting artists to work for free, and it's a good way to get started. But um, I, I really would like to see it end put to those. And an RFQ only asks for examples of your previous work, so you're going to have to have all this together in your toolkit. So an RFP will ask you for concept proposal and sketches. I found a very abbreviated version of how to read a call for artists. Actually, this is just, you, you look through it, you decide if you can apply all the usual things, deadline, eligibility, do your goals, do their goals for the artwork interest you? Because if you can't maintain the passion all the way through one of these projects, which, is, which can take a year and a half to two years to do, then you really shouldn't. Um, be going for it. But this is the most important one. You need to be inspired and you need to have something in your work that you can see, you can envision being applied to that space. So a letter of interest is a persuasive document. It's not quite a sales document because you, you need to talk about the work with respect, and it's you know it's forbidden to talk about money in the art world, so you can't like have it be use the language of sales. You have to use the language of art to talk about it. Remember when they're by the time you make it to the place with in the selection process where they're reading your letter of interest, they probably looked at several hundred artists' work already. They've weeded it out. They've had lunch. They're down to like the last 30 or 40. Then the letters of interest come out. It's after, you know, they're, they're tired. They probably had a lunch of carbs. You need to uh, start with a very strong uh, beginning. So this is one that I what became a finalist for. And so I, I kind of do the dance of the seven veils on here. I don't tell them exactly what I'm going to do, nor am I really vague. I try to give them a hint 
of what it is that I would do, what my inspiration was that led me to go through this application process to begin with. So then you need to come in with your credibility, what you've done before. Um, if you haven't done any public art commissions, just whatever community projects you've done, what value you bring to each project. This is something where it really helps to have someone uh, helping you with your first one or two. I spent a lot of time teaching this. So this is what I said for my second paragraph for this particular application. And I got to be a finalist because of that last sentence. They said, which was just sort of like smoke and mirrors, I said, I made up this phrase, internally lighted object structures, which, you know, it's not bullshit. It, I was really interested in doing something like that, but they really fixated mm -hmm. on that. Somehow kind of the, the poetry or the visual image that was able to make in their brain, uh, they latched onto that. So I got to be a finalist. And then I talk about how I work. I'm, I'm really to the point in my career now where I just I just tell it how it is. I used to try to second guess what I thought they'd want to hear, and I just don't do that anymore. This is all sort of take it or leave it with me on these now. So, um, and then you summarize your resume so they can hear it another way. And it's, it's really important to me to um, talk to the stakeholders, understand the building. I, I just don't parachute my work in. Each work I, I do for public space is different and very much informed by the site. As an old salesman a long time ago you know, taught me the trick. So you need to ask for the sale. And I, I think it would be interesting to hear how Paul talks about this. But, you know, he was, it's not like give me the money, but there's, a way that you you close a sale um, <clears throat> in all these stages. And so I would say something like this. We have something very simple, but you know, I I would love to be a finalist. And so then I became a finalist and then I have another step that I go after that. So that's what I do in my workshops. <laughs> um, Here's very quickly, I just want to show you, I think this is so important because I, as a public art curator, I saw hundreds of, uh, and I was chair of the public art committee of the Seattle Arts Commission, I saw hundreds of public art proposals. And I know that a lot of you uh, don't have that opportunity, so I wanted to show you what is required in a public art finalist proposal so you know what you're up against. And very few artists will share them. And so that's why you're going to see one of mine. And these are all the things you need to bring with you when you're chosen as a finalist. And there will be maybe three to five people, other artists chosen as a finalist. And you'll be presenting this in front of the committee. You will have to travel to wherever they are. This uh, last artist that I lost to, <laughs> they got display boards. And actually, I gave a presentation in Boston, a workshop recently, and um, the other the artist I invited in to give a presentation uh, to show examples of his finalist presentations, he said he always brings in display boards because if all else fails, if like the assistant forgot to bring the PowerPoint projector or the bulb fails or, you know, whatever, he will have his display boards as a backup. And I think that's really an excellent idea. You need to tell them how your concept relates to their site and their priorities. You have to tell them in black and white. You have to tie it back into what they said they wanted, how what you came up with responded to that. Tie it into the larger world, what were your influences, and then just point their little heads to it and say, this is how all this came together in this artwork. Remember, this is not going to be a committee of art experts. This is going to be like the head librarian, the head of construction, the head of facilities. So, um, and maybe there'll be one or two artists on the committee also. But, you know, it's probably, it could be a watercolorist from the local watercolor society and the sister-in-law of the mayor who, you know, also does watercolors or something. So, um, 
And I'm not saying that in a despising sort of way. I'm just saying that that's realistic, and I actually enjoy that. I enjoy the unpretentiousness of talking to people that way. So here's uh, the U University of Wisconsin School of Human Ecology. This was my presentation to them, my finalist presentation, and I did win. So here's, I'm showing them what the site is. I'm zeroing in so they can orient it. It's this very large building. The committee needs to know where the artwork's going to go. I did this model of the building based on the information I was given doing a program called SketchUp, which if you don't already know it, I highly recommend you use it. The first thing I started out with was their mission statement. It's like, I have, I have read and I respect your mission statement. And so I started, because the school, because human ecology is the study of how all organisms and systems are interdependent, I um, really boiled it down. I had to boil it down to something visual, what their mission statement was. So I started here in my influence, the different cellular structures getting larger and larger. Lava flow, how a wall can't stand without everything built on top of it. Geological strata, the whole concept of the grotto, looking through things. And I, I take it from the micro to the macro. Then these are some of the materials. So I remind them that I show them that I thought, uh, so here are the materials you're going to be using in the site. They're all natural, they're glass, they're shiny stuff, everything's very organic, everything, you've got a lot of backlighting. And then I took the site, which is on the left, and behind the site, which is actually underground, right. there's a hill. Um, and then beyond the hill is a big lake. So the whole conceit of the artwork was that you're seeing through the hill. And then I drew these, this too. This is the artwork, it, and I wanted to show them what it was made of. <coughs> it's Byzantine glass mosaic with gold, marble, and then backlit on it, backlit on it. Fiber optic, this is how so, like I said, there's always going to be somebody, the architect or the construction manager, that wants to know how it all goes together. And so then what I do usually is um, I'll leave this up on the screen, and then I'll hand out packets that have my budget and schedule and maintenance. So that's when they are uh, talking later about uh, over talking it over. They'll have a packet in front of them that shows pictures. So they need to have all of this with them in the packet. And so that's it. I'm done. That's my presentation, and I am ready for questions. Turn back control to me so I can see who's going with the questions, OK? Then up top center, I think you have to give me back control. Stop sharing. Okay. There we go. There. All right. Um, So does anybody have any questions about that? Or do, can you see yourself doing public art at all? Amber, do you have a question? I'm going to pretend Amber has a question. I'm unmuting Amber. Amber, do you have a question? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Wait a minute. I didn't unmute Amber. There. There. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. So, Amber, if you had a question, what would your question be? My question would be, um, how much time do you spend <laughs> doing um, the proposal stages? Because I, I remember when I first got out of art school, I, I put out some proposals and did all the drawings and stuff, and then I was doing work that I wasn't being paid for just to try to get the work. So I decided to go back to the... The application takes about... I eight to ten hours because I do a lot of background. How much time? I mean, that part just seems so involved. That takes initial. It it takes about eight to ten hours to just do the respond to the request for qualification. 
and then it takes uh, probably 100 to 150 hours once I'm chosen as a finalist to put together my finalist presentation. And it usually involves, uh, often involves one trip out to the site. That's a lot of work. It's, it's a ton of work, but by that point, I have a one in three chance, you know, of, of winning. I, it was just shortlisted for two transit stations in Nevada, um, for the state of Nevada, and I withdrew from them because um, there was just something kind of hinky about the, the selection process, and I, they had too many finalists. They, the budget was very uncertain. And I could tell by the other artists that I was up against that I was probably going to lose the one with the big budget because I was up against Gordon Huther and Alan, Alice Acock. And Gordon Huther wins everything because he does glass. And pretty much, you know, my rule of thumb is if it's shiny, it'll win. You know, the shiniest art always wins in public art. Um, so I had to take that into consideration. And then the second transit station, I probably could have won, but they said it was up to 125000 And my minimum for you know, getting on a plane and going to do something as a $150,000 budget. I just really learned the hard way I can't make money um, if, if it's below a certain budget. And that's one thing I think a lot about is, you know, we talked, I think, with the, the subtext of a lot of your questions to Jerry and I think for the whole reason you're taking this webinar series is, you know, to learn how to make a living as an artist, and, and maybe some of you don't want to do that full time, and that's, that's fine, but those of you who do, one thing I've learned is to just, we're our own worst enemies because we work for free too much, and we give ourselves away, and uh, you just have to stop doing that because it lowers the bar for, for all the rest of us. It's a strange economy we live in as artists. I agree. You know, artists need to, I mean, it's like the same, like the labor unions in Wisconsin. People need to stand up and be counted. Oh, man, they do. And the first thing we have to do is organize. I mean, that's, that's and that, I'm on the board of the Chicago Artists Coalition now, and uh, I'm just putting all my, I don't volunteer for anything else now. I'm kind of the artist liaison for this, and it's like, it's our a really good big hope for all of us just to, to get together so we have a collective voice. The Chicago Artists Coalition is actually the one that, you know, 30 years ago did the lobbying that resulted in the Percent for Art program here, for our public art program. That's true. When you work with um, these different commissions, who's putting out these RFPs? It's, well, it could be the county. It's always a governmental agency. Are they working with, I mean, are you working directly with a bunch of people who are issuing an RFP who've never done art before? Or are they working with an art consultant? Is there an intermediary that they hire? Or what scenarios do you encounter? Every kind of scenario. Some of the larger cities can afford to have a public art staff. And these are people, they're great because they're professionals. They know how to deal with artists. Some of them hire freelance public art consultants, like what you did for McCormick Place. And um, some of the private developers will do that. And I'm actually trying to get more into working with private developers. Um, I hired a wonderful financial um, strategic planner for to look at my business, Nancy Herring. And she just like really nailed it. She said was, you know, like in three years the stimulus money is going to be drying up. But there's going to be a lot of, you know, transit funded jobs. And that's true. It's like I'm, I'm getting shortlisted for all these like transit stations around the country. And then she said, Cities and states are going to be reaching their debt limit, and they are simply going to have to stop their public art programs. And she nailed it. That's what's, ha that's what's exactly what ha is happening. And so she was telling me, you, Canada's going to have a lot of money. They're going to be okay. They've got oil. The Midwest is going to rise again. They're going to start having more money because of the grain sales to China. And I'm actually able to start seeing that happen. I'm actually understanding, you know, the, the ebb and flow of money in the economy, and my whole motto has always been, you know, follow the money. And now I know how to do that better. So I'm just getting super, super hardcore about having a bottom line of things I don't apply for, not wasting my time with certain things, um, looking where the money is in the private sector, going after that, and, you know, it's really exciting. I'm making a living. I really love the thrill of the hunt. And if you don't like that, I mean, you really need to consider 
you know, don't quit your day job if, if you don't have the stomach for it. So it's a lot of risk. How about the balance? I mean, you were talking about liking your painting and thinking about gallery exhibitions. How long has it been since you pursued a gallery? I was in flat file until it closed, but I really don't like being in galleries. Talk about control. I really like having control. So I work a lot with our consultants now. But the same financial analyst pointed out to me that 70% of my income was coming from public art, and that was not good. <laughs> so she said, you've got to beef up the painting part of it. And I was just sort of doing the painting as this is something I don't have to worry about selling. But now I've gotten really aggressive about building up my list of our consultants around the country to work with, and that's starting to bear fruit. So I'm trying to get it to be at least 50-50. So, um, so you want, when you, uh, uh, well, I don't know, try English, Paul. Um, working with our consultants around the country towards what end? What's the purpose? What, um, well, to sell them my paintings. For, but, so this is, how, where does that fit in the 50-50? What does that have to do with galleries? I, I'm really struggling with whether I need to be in a gallery or not. In fact, I'm doing a workshop at the Chicago Artist Coalition right now. Uh, it's like, you know, sort of like galleries, huh? What are they good for? And so when you say 50 50, 50% 50 commissions, 50% pop art, regardless of if it's a gallery or not, is that what you I, mean? I, I asked, well, you mean by pop art, what do you mean, like portable works, like painting? Yeah, stuff you made without it being sold first. Yeah, yeah. I want to not rely so much on public art, especially with the prediction. But the understanding of the economy now that it's going to be drying up for maybe for a little while before it bounces back in. I don't want to be vulnerable. I don't want to have to go work for anybody else again. I've gone feral. Gone feral. Okay. Huh. Um, all right. Other people have questions? I'm going to unmute everybody and see who's got a question there. You are all now unmuted. Who has a question? Let's go about near working with art consultants versus going after... All right, wait a minute. Catherine, hold on one second. Let me mute everybody and unmute you. Okay, and then I'm going to unmute them. But go ahead, Catherine. Okay, I understand going after the galleries. How do you go about going after the art consultants? What, what well, that? it's the, you know, old thing. Once you know where to look, they're just everywhere. There are just hundreds and hundreds of them around the country. And I actually wrote a... a rather lengthy article on this for Chicago Art Machine. It's part of Chicago Art Magazine, but it's pretty much everything I know about working with art consultants is in that Chicago Art Machine article that I wrote a couple months ago. But um, there are art consultants specialize in certain sectors, like hospitality, healthcare, or corporate, and that's for the business, or residential. And they, um, I, like I write in this article, they're like velociraptors. They're just out there constantly trolling for business. And they're super competitive. And they um, are constantly need fresh blood with, with new artists. And so, but very few artists go to the effort, I mean, very few. I mean, there are thousands of us who do. But relatively few go to the effort because they're still sort of brainwashed into thinking, oh, I, I must be in a gallery. It's like, I just find that, you know, every time I've been in a gallery, they've sold one or two pieces, and then after the show, you've worked those back into the stack. However, I, I did send my studio manager to the Armory show because I'm looking for galleries in other markets, not Chicago, for my paintings that um, also do the fairs. I, I just don't want to be in a gallery that doesn't do the fairs. I think... Um, they don't have to take my word to the fairs, but they have to be out there doing the fairs and making those contacts. So I've recently been spending a lot of time researching galleries around the country that, that have the work that fits with my aesthetic and also do the fairs and have an art consulting branch. Those are my criteria for art for galleries. That's, that's the only way I'll be in a gallery again. And with art consultants, a lot of them, they want these uh, chiclets. I hate that word, but you know, they're inkjet prints, high quality inkjet prints, and that's what I'm actually selling more of than the in the original objects. So, um, one of the art consultants I work with just presented my work to Creighton Barrel, 
I I just started doing something, sending out any newsletter, and I only send it out to our consultants, and there's like 130 on the list right now, and these are only our consultants that we've completely researched. Uh, our consultants hate for you to approach them if they don't have the sort, like same with galleries. If you if their work if your work is not compatible with their work, if you haven't done their homework, they just they just throw you to the side. They're like this person is clueless. So there are 130 art consultants, and it's just growing all the time on my list whose work is compatible with mine. And I'm getting a good, really good response from sending out this. We send out a beautiful newsletter every month with my new work on it, and we always get like two or three hits back that will say, oh, I've got this client. The other thing about art consultants is they really respond with what's in front of them. I mean, literally, I have sold so much work where this is when I was sending out postcards before I got hip to the e-newsletter thing. They would, I, they'd get my postcard, and it would be literally on the top of their pile when a client calls. It's like, oh, I have an artist, you know. So you have to keep in constant touch with them. I think that's really good advice, and I think it's one of the things that we reiterate a lot in the class is the two factors you just mentioned. One is that it's about relationships, and two is that it's about numbers, you know, and the more you put it out there and the more people that see it, you know, this art stuff is totally subjective, and if you show it to enough people, somebody's going to agree with it, no matter how bad or how good your work is. Yeah. All right, that's it. I'm going to unmute everyone some more and see if we got some more questions here. Everybody is unmuted. I have a little bit of a question. Go ahead, Mary. Hi, Lynn. It's Mary Broger. Hear me? Yeah, I hear you fine. It's nice to see you and see your project. Um, Thank I you. To... I love your work every time I drive by it. That's big to oh. me, sculpture. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm about to pitch a, something to um, uh, the, uh, the Fred Meyer Sculpture Garden in my hometown of Grand Rapids, Michigan. And there's some technical things I need to know about it. It's broken mirror used as a mosaic. May I email you and ask you a couple things? I, you know, I rely so much on my fabricators to tell me that sort of thing that I, I really don't know much of anything. I mean, okay. I, I, uh, I would suggest you talk to someone like Jenny Sykes. Jenny Sykes. Okay. Yeah, Jenny Sykes. She's just done a ton of mosaic, and I and she does uses a lot of broken um, pieces in her work. Is it S Y K? I mean S I K or S Y K E S. If you want to just email me, I can connect you with her. She's a good friend of mine. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, Lynn. You're welcome. Um, 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 um all right, everybody's unmuted again. More questions. I want to know why you don't have questions. Is it just like it's an overwhelming, you know, why there aren't more questions? It's, I'm, I'm worried that it's just too new, I, that it's just like it is very overwhelming world. It's the whole parallel universe to the whole gallery world. But it's there's just a lot of action in, in public art. And I want to, that's why I killed myself to write that book, because I really want to help artists uh, be able to, to bridge that, that gap, because it's a really good way to it's another income stream. I don't have a question, but I have more of a statement. Um, this is Victoria Fuller. Hi, Victoria. Yeah, um, I've applied this year to eight different commissions, and I didn't get any of them. And I, I don't, I haven't done as much as you have in my presentations, and now I see where I, you know, have fallen through. So um, this has been helpful. Yeah, it's that's, I apply to about 30 a year. And um, last year I was a finalist for 10, and that was the most ever. And I only won one. So that kind of gives you a sense of, of the odds. Uh, it was a really tough year last year. I, I really questioned why, uh, what, what I was doing wrong. And um, you can't. Sometimes you just have dry spells. Do you work outside the United States, Lynn, or only in the U.S.? Only in the U.S. Is it different outside the U.S.? How do, you, do you know about other countries? It's just, again, I, I do. There's a, lot, there's a lot going on in Australia, a lot going on in England. 
Um, but that's about, you know, that's about it. There's a ton that was going on in the Middle East, uh, but it was mostly through private development, and I have not been able to crack that nut. And I've recently done a lot of research into China, and they are just really interested in their own artists right now and, and kind of reclaiming their own their own heritage. Pace, you might know about this, Paul, but Pace Gallery built this spectacular gallery. I don't know if it's in Shanghai or Beijing. And they're having a hard time. Nobody wants to buy those artists that we're just like, you know, salivating over here in this country that are a really big deal. It's hard, you know, a lot of these kinds of things are like, you know, it's a moving target and you know, there are lots of different art worlds. I mean, it's one of the things, I mean, I don't know that, it, I guess we should touch on it here, but I mean, you know, I don't think it's so smart to try and predict trends necessarily because by the time you notice it, it might be too late, especially aesthetically. But, you know, I don't know. I, I know that galleries have had a hard time in LA. I, I'm in Los Angeles. The, you know, national galleries that have moved there, though, they keep doing it. And I think the same thing occurs in China. I think you're right. Other questions, people? When you were talking about your e-newsletter, you said um, we compiled a list and we sent out the newsletter. I'm just wondering, do you have? Hey, I can't hear. <laughs> so, uh, hold on, let me mute everybody except you, um, Sarah, and hope to get back to you. Hold on. I think Christopher had a question too. All right, we'll get to him too. Um, Sarah, go ahead. Oh, um, my question was about, like, um, I know that a lot of uh, organizations are putting on, like, outdoor exhibitions. Do you find, um, like, have you found that your method of building these applications is actually really helpful in those types of situations as well? In the filling out the public art applications is helpful, and I missed this part, in what kind of uh, situations? No problem. Um, I'm just thinking of exhibitions that tend to be held outdoors in public spaces. Like, would you think that um, following those guidelines would be really helpful for helping, say, a committee or a jury actually um, basically um, picture the project that was happening in public space as opposed to well, a gallery setting? This, yeah, this is. Yeah. A, a kind of an indirect answer to your question, but there are more and more temporary public art uh, yeah. opportunities out there now, and definitely yeah. there are good entry level points for artists. You and be sure you document the heck out of the work when you get it there, because even the, the committees are not going to care that it's temporary. They need to see your work in a or even if it's in a restaurant. I mean, one of my first pieces was done in a restaurant. I hung it in a restaurant and had a professionally photographed. And that, that means a lot to committee. They need to literally see it in context. So, mm -hmm. yeah, enter those. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Someone else? Yes, this is Christopher. Yeah, yeah. Christopher. So, you have. Uh, been a finalist and you've won, and it's like, well, that must be must be party time when that happens. Um, but so, could you talk from that point on? You know, like how much time are you spending <laughs> going to the site, working with people? You know, how do you manage? Uh, you know, not spending uh, so much of your time that you're not making much money at it. What's what's the process like once you've landed the the work? Here's the kicker. By the time I've landed the project, I've already done the work. I all my hard work, which is all the conceptual part, the budgeting, finding the fabricator. After that, and, you know, and visiting the site. After that, it's a few site visits to check on how my how the fabricator is doing. Showing up for the big dedication party at the end. Wow. Going to the bank. That's wow. it. Wow. Yeah. But when you're a finalist, you only get paid between fifteen hundred to three thousand dollars. But that's when most of your work is, and you mm -hmm. don't know whether you're going to win. So you have to be super careful not to lose too much money at that point. So you get paid for being a finalist. You do, yeah. Wow. But if breaking even is good, because you have to go all out to try to win. 
Is there stuff that's not in the book that you would have added since it's been published that those who've read it need to have revised information or, you know, what's new? Oh, gosh. Yeah, I did think of something. Yeah, you know what? It's what I, I alluded to when I was doing my presentation here. It's like I I actually don't pay as much attention to what I think they want. I pay more attention to what I think they need. So I don't second guess them as much anymore because you try I, to educate them more than you what you had before. I it's more like I try to let the true spirit of the artwork show through and let it speak for itself. Even though they do require you to explain to them um, where you're coming from as an artist and why, you, but yeah, your passion and your commitment to the work really shows through. And I notice that the people I lose to um, sort of just did whatever they felt the site needed. And whenever I do that, I usually win too. So I, I tend to be kind of a pleaser personality, and um, I'm trying to cut that out. I'm trying to just like really get in, you know, I take lots of naps and think about and visualize the site. And then that's what I try to do. Just con you know, convince them of my passion and the rightness of that work for that site, even though it might have been nothing that they thought that they wanted. That's the value artists bring, is that new vision, that new way of looking at a space that a committee could never have, you know, come up with on their own. I hear you. I believe in that. I believe in that too, Lynn. I've had experiences where I convinced somebody of something else just because I felt so good about what should have been there. Oh, I know. It, like, I was just, I just lost one. Actually, I didn't lose. I got relegated to a smaller part of it up in, um, for private development up in St. Paul. And it's like the whole RFQ and all our meetings that the client were about how they wanted everything to be site integrated and integrated in the architecture, and that's why they were bringing artists early on in the construction. And so one of the other art, artists, finalists, she designed a huge big, big piece of plop art, the big mm -hmm. sculpture, and that's not one. And I was like, why did you say what a site-specific architecturally integrated work when you really wanted a big piece of pop art, well, you know, the real answer is they didn't know they wanted a big piece of pop art until they saw the big piece of pop art proposal. And, you know, I love these other artists, and I'm happy for them, and we're going to work together on this. But still, it, you, just, you have to just go what you think is right. That's what I would have changed in the book. Interesting. Okay. Sarah in Hong Kong has a question for you. Hold on. We're, being, we're getting intercontinental here. Okay, Sarah, go ahead. Hey, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm just wondering. Uh... Wait a minute, we can't hear you anymore. I muted you by mistake. It's my fault. Start, <laughs> over, start over again. Right. Um, I was just wondering, like, um, for example, you mentioned China. Um, I do think, actually, there is a lot of potential there, not for galleries. You're totally right. But commission-wise, there is a lot of things on the construction. But I'm just wondering if it's physically really possible because, you know, um, I don't know, if you construct an artwork and you need, like, local contractors, and would that not scare you? Or, like, the fact that you have the language barrier or that it's really far away traveling. So if it's physically possible, you think, for you to handle a commission in China? Well, yeah, for, well, I forgot to say, for 15 years, I had my rugs and tapestries woven in Nepal. And I, so I do know how to work internationally, even though they do speak English there. And I did have some rugs made in Beijing, uh, actually not in Beijing, in outer Mongolia. And so um, I, I, I have had some work done there, and I saw how easy it was. And um, because you just find a good manager and to, to do that. And I, I like using local fabricators because I like keeping money in the local economy. Like this piece I just did for Kingsport, Tennessee, I used all local trade in doing it. And that was part of the symbolism of the piece to me, is that we used all local materials and all local trade because the piece was at the gateway to this new vocational uh, training center so that they could uh, train a new workforce. Paul, are we losing you? <laughs> no, no, but I was thinking about that. And, you know, I think it is. It's a nice selling point that, you know, these local communities, wherever you're doing the commission, you know, if, I mean, if you're using local 
um, craftsman and puts you ahead of the folks who are not? That's what I think. Sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes it does. But it's a, something I do feel passionately about, and I, it's an ethic of mine. And so I'm not going to try to change it to try. And besides, it is a moving target. Like you said, you can't second guess what they want because there are just too many variables. So you have the only constant is what it, your vision is as the artist. All right, I'm unmuting everybody again. Let's see if we got any more questions here, and maybe we should end head towards conclusion. Anybody got a question? I have a question. Um, how much? Uh, uh, Steve, let me let me let me mute everybody again here for a second. Oops, mute. Oh. Unmute, Steve. Okay, Steve. Um, how much of your um budget goes towards fabrication and how much do you get to pocket? Good question. I, yeah, I always take out 15% off the top and it is sacrosanct. And that's my money and travel doesn't come out of it. That's just, that's my artist fee. And so when I put together my budget, everything else is a line item. Travel, um, meeting time and creative thinking time, staring off into space, that comes out of the 15%. But travel, fabricators, that's pretty much it. Travel fabricators is pretty much all there is. And then I, there's, I put a 2% overhead figure in there, too, for, you know, paying a percentage of my insurance and stuff. Do you think that's normal? Do you think other people do more? Oh, lots of people do more. Everybody has their little different formula. Most artists I know do 20%, but they erode that with other things. You know, like they'll have travel and meals and stuff come out of there. I don't do that. I know some artists who do 25%. And sometimes to get a project, I'll do 10% on one and, you know, 25% on the next one if I think it's bad enough. And I, this one I just finished at the University of Northern Iowa, the big black and white swirly terrazzo floor. I only made $6,000 on that. I mean, but every time somebody looks at it in my portfolio, they just, I mean, like, they go weak at the knees. It's such a fabulous piece, and I know it's going to lead to, to more things, like, that I want to do. I just wanted to see the piece done. It happens, you know. I mean, I know artists have lost money on commissions, you know, almost by intent because they want to see it done. Yeah, I will never lose money, but I'll, you know, I won't take my full rate. Anybody else have a question before we wrap it up? Is there a workshop this weekend for uh, uh, at uh, the cultural center? For us? Panel. On a panel? Yeah, I'm on a panel at noon, um, but it's going to be on what your definition of success is. This and is at the cultural center. That then on Saturday. I created Chicago Expo, but. We are having a little like half hour salon thing in the car in the car creative lounge. And one of the topics that I'm going to be talking about and I can't find the schedule is um, do you really need to be in a gallery? We're having like these little half hour flash topics. Um, so because I feel like I just need to talk this over with other artists. I'm so I, I'm actually not conflicted about it. It's like I don't want to be in a gallery, but I sort of feel like I should. Or just the, the critical um, credibility that gives you. That's how, it, that's how the art world works. I don't think anybody has. You know, I think it should be a choice. I don't think you need to be in a gallery. But I mean, I, I understand what you're saying because there is certain mainstream activity that goes on there where you know your work gets disseminated or judged in that in that venue or that discipline, and it's not happening so much because you're doing public commissions to such an extent. Yeah, so no, some, you know, maybe it's nice to have the balance. I don't know. No, I'm probably, you know, if on the scale of successful artists, I'm probably fairly successful. I'm like the most successful artist you've never heard of, you know, because I sell my work through art consultants and through public uh, art commissions, and I I don't have the prestige of being in in a white wall space anymore. Um, so I'm just trying to assess: is that damaging my future? Is that you know? I don't know the answer to it yet. And I don't know. Not necessarily monetarily, but perhaps your ego. You know, I mean, Jerry was talking about dancing naked in public. You know, maybe you're dancing naked, but not quite so public. Maybe you're behind, you know, behind the screen. Um, you know, but 
it, it depends. I don't know. I think it has to. It has to. I think it's more about your ego than anything else, probably. I don't think it's affecting you monetarily. I, it, it, you know, it could, but I don't think it is. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to talk about there. I, I don't know. Fair enough. So it'll be discussed in, uh, on Saturday. I don't think so. I don't think it's that kind of panel. Oh. Oh, I should. Maybe I should invite these guys. On. Um, I'm having a. Oh, I forgot the most important thing. Um, I have. <laughs> I have a whole bunch of little goodies to give you, which are a bunch of uh, public art RQs, some of which are local and they're not very well known. And there's some good starter ones. And then I've got some national ones that are open to artists nationally. And I'm going to just count those and I'll send them to you, Paul, and then you can disseminate them. Through. It's okay, through. if you want, or do you want everybody to have your email address? I mean, I can, you can just send them to them, everybody directly if you want. Let me do that. Whatever you, whatever is easy, it's whatever you want. It's just literally. So. All right, um, we'll do all of that. Then Basa at Basa dot com. So it's L Y N N B A S A at B A S A dot com. No, Lynn Basa dot com. This might oh. be white. Yeah, I'm sorry, I got the last. One. So it's, it's Lynn Basa at Lynn Basa dot com. Exactly. Okay. The more you say your name, don't just keep the URL. Just have your name on it. Better name recognition. All right. Well, I'll send that out. And Sarah in Hong Kong said she wanted to get in touch with you directly because of things she's doing there that maybe you guys can share experiences and maybe even work together. So. Yeah, I would love that. I'm. I'm still. Yeah, I would love that. That would be fantastic. Thanks. What about the What about the salon? Oh, the salon on. March 16th at 6 o'clock at my house, and you guys are all invited. You know, I'm, I'm very involved with the Chicago Artists Coalition, and we're having a membership salon where so we're getting people donated, and there's going to be like a little feel about there's just so many benefits for artists in CAC, but nobody knows about them. And so we're just going to have salons in different people's homes where it's like invited artists to have, and have them bring those artists. I want to have like 40 people crammed into my house in my studio on Wednesday the 16th, and Paul has been invited, but he's not to get RSVP. And um, <laughs> How do, where's your place? How do we find it? It's at 2248 North Campbell, C A M P B E L, like the soup. Don't do what the cab drivers do and go to Kimball by mistake. It's Campbell, and it's at, it's near it's one block west of Western and two blocks south of Fullerton. <laughs> and six o'clock this Wednesday. And again, if you email me, I'd be happy to send you out the official invite with all the instructions and everything. But it it would be really great to see you guys there. And if you're not already a member of CAC, I think um, now's a good time to join. For a while, it wasn't doing anything, and I was just sort of giving them my dues out of duty. <laughs> but um, now it's just really heating up. I'll send everybody, everybody everybody's information so that you have Lynn's email address, etc. Great. Thank Lynn, you. thank you. A lot of good information there. Everybody run out and buy the book because the notes you took weren't sufficient. And um, Lynn and I are both involved in this thing Saturday at the uh, Cultural Center. Have you done this before, Lynn? Yeah, every year. I do something. This is my first time doing it. I hope it's worthwhile. I'm doing a little um, talk, I think, at 1.30, too. Oh, good. What's um, the, it's a model. I, know, I enjoy this class a lot. I think the information's really good, and I think the questions and the group are really excellent, too. Oh, I think it's amazing. Well, just it's going to – people are going to love hearing you on Saturday, and um, I'm, I'm sure you're going to be mobbed. It's the, it's the biggest uh, creative expo ever. They're going to use the entire cultural center this year. Wow, cool. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm, work, I'm working on my little brochure, but somebody said they didn't like my photo on it, so I, now I don't know what to do. Wait, is that your new one? Is that your new one? I just started working on it last night. I like it. Yeah. I mean, it had instant, it had instant, like, oh, oh. You should yeah. be naked, Paul. They what? The ones be naked. naked. Yeah, that's the problem. And... <laughs> All right, now that we've got that resolved, I'm going to stop recording 20 minutes ago. All, All right, you guys. Um, I think the next time we get together is on Monday afternoon, so I will send you information about that. That's the people in Chicago. Um, 
I've enjoyed the night. Thank you all very much, Lynn. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you too. And I'm going to stop the recording. And um, good night, all. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.